Welcome to Other Voices, brought to you by Peninsula Peace and Justice Center. I'm your host, Paul George. On this month's edition of the program, we're going to take a look at very recent events, the uh, shooting at UC Santa Barbara, yet another tragic uh, mass gun shooting here in this country. Uh, about 18 months after Newtown, Congress still has not acted. The point of tonight's show is to look at some other things that might happen while we continually wait on Congress to do something about out-of-control gun violence in this country. We have uh, two very interesting guests here with uh, some ideas of things that we can do locally. Let me introduce them to you right now. At the far end of the table, we have Ian Johnstone, who is co-founder of an organization called Gun by Gun. Uh, they do gun buyback programs, and we're going to learn a lot more about that. Ian has been involved in the issue of gun violence uh, prevention since the age of 10, when his father was shot and killed in an attempted robbery in San Francisco. And you also work um, a regular job, so this is a volunteer um, aspiration for you, I take it. It is volunteer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, Thanks. I'm looking forward to learning more about it. And speaking of legislation, I'm really pleased to have former Assemblywoman Sally Lieber with us. Sally, welcome. Sally Lieber served in the California State Assembly from 2002 until 2008, representing California's 22nd Assembly District. And she was the Assembly Speaker Pro Tem, only the third woman to hold this leadership position in the state of California since 1849. That's stunning. <laughs> a little bit of opportunity for more women to come into the process yeah. there. <laughs> Maybe we should do a show on that, too. Before uh, going to the State Assembly, Sally was a councilwoman and mayor of the city of Mountain View. And since retiring from the Assembly, uh, not since, but uh, since retiring, you've been very active in local gun control measures, gun violence reduction measures is what we should say. We're not talking about gun control, are we? We're talking about gun safety measures and sensible laws that, that we can do while we're waiting. Um, let's just, before we get into the local stuff and what we can do while we're waiting on Congress, it's, let me turn to each of you and, and turn and get your reactions to this latest tragedy that we've had to witness and, and kind of the national reaction or lack of reaction, certainly on Capitol Hill this time. Let me, let me start with you, Ian, down at that end. Uh, I think the shooting in uh, down in, in Isla Vista, it it really underscores the the problem in the U.S. right now of how easy it is for criminals and the mentally ill to gain access to a gun. I mean, this shooter had uh, had you know his his parents uh, already suspected that there was a problem. Like he was well known as, as being mentally disturbed. Um, his parents had actually called the police on him. He was basically posting YouTube saying he was going to do something like this. Yeah. He was still able to access a semi-automatic handgun. The police responded to the scene less than 10 minutes after they were called, but he was still able to, to kill all those people. And I think it just, it, it, it shows the dangers that exist when uh, these, these sorts of people can get their hands on guns so easily. Sally, quick thoughts in your reaction. Well, there's obviously the, the personal level for the families that were very involved. And um, I know that so many people in our communities know what that's like when uh, really the, the nuclear bomb blast of, of a death or a disfigurement or a suicide of a person close to you uh, due to guns happens. Um, but also looking at our, our freedoms as a society Right now, we have a World Trade Center worth of victims every three months in our country. And so we're really at a, at a watershed moment where we have to decide, are we asking teachers to have the courage to practice what they should do if there's an active shooter in the classroom, but we aren't willing to ask our elected officials to have the small modicum of courage that it takes to step up, even when it's futile, and say, I demand better than this for my constituents. And so um, I think that uh, regrettably shootings like this are, are going to continue. Um, really as our population uh, reacts to ethnic diversity in society and many times by uh, hunkering down and becoming combative, um, I think that we're going to see more gun violence. And so it's incumbent on each of us to try to do what we can with whatever tools we have. Let's just stay on Isla Vista for a moment. And 
because I'd like to try to figure out what happened. Uh, Ian, you pointed out quite rightly that this guy's parents had reported him to the police. The police had made contact with him, yet he was still able to legally purchase seven guns, I think it was, plus all this ammunition. What happened with the law? Why was he able to do that? He was, he was known to be having severe mental problems. Um, how did he slip through the cracks, and what might we have to do to fill those cracks in such a blatant case like this? Mm -hmm. Either one of you jump on it. Yeah, I, I think that uh, one of the areas where uh, policy is failing us is in terms of involuntary commitment. Uh, we have a law in California that's called Laura's Law. It's named after a young woman who was uh, killed in an instance of uh, gun violence. And um, unfortunately, Laura's Law only comes into play and would allow for people to be determined to be prohibited persons from buying guns um, if a particular county has implemented it. And there are only, I think, three counties in California that have implemented Laura's Law and therefore have it in effect. So this is a very tragic situation when the parents seemingly did what they could um, towards uh, trying to stop their son from doing this, and it's, it's obviously an overwhelming tragedy for them as well. Um, but absent yeah, yeah, that... Yeah, you kind of get the feeling they saw this coming. Yeah, but absent <laughs> that, uh, that ability to um, have the involuntary commitment that would box someone out of being able to easily acquire weapons, which are available in every city in California virtually, um, it really leaves families with nowhere to go. And it's a very tragic, tragic situation uh, for families like Does, that. Does uh, Santa Clara County um, have Laura's Law in that? No, Santa, neither Santa Clara County nor San Mateo County have implemented Laura's Law. And so I think that that's something that we uh, can all push on and ask our city councils uh, to really push on. Uh, because this process of um, boxing a dangerous individual who poses a danger to themselves or others out of being able to simply go a couple miles and buy a cheap gun is, is really what we need to have. Yeah. What about all the ammunition that he bought? I mean, the, he could have done this much damage with one gun. So, you know, he, he had seven or something like that. But he had a tremendous amount of ammunition. Shouldn't that have set off some alarms and bells somewhere? But the laws don't exist, I guess, to have it set off mm -hmm. an alarm. Well, yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah. it, it should. I mean, um, I've heard now that Sunnyvale has a registration of ammunition sales. Um, there have been complaints from people who enjoy target practice that they can go through 1,200 rounds in a weekend. And uh -huh. so the 500 rounds that this young man had with him uh, could have done tremendous uh, damage, obviously. And, and I think Ian can speak more to just the the easy availability of guns. Yeah. But, uh, okay, so let's talk about some of these, these options that people can do locally while we're waiting on Congress. We, we, we'll get back to <laughs> beating up on Congress <laughs> before the end of the show, I, I promise. Um, <laughs> but uh, let's start with the gun buyback program. I, I think uh, people are at least generally familiar with what gun buyback programs are, but tell us First of all, what gun by gun, your organization, um, how you go about doing the, the gun sure. buybacks, and then we'll talk about the, the whys and wherefores. Of it. Sure, sure. Uh, so gun buybacks, they're basically, they're held by local law enforcement, and it's this event where anybody can come in and turn in a gun, no questions asked, and receive some sort of compensation, um, and the guns usually get destroyed. Um, what we do is we use crowdfunding to finance the gun buybacks. Um, Typically, they run out of money before they run out of people that are, are showing up willing to turn in their guns. So we're using crowdfunding as a way to generate the funds to support the buyback. Um, and it also gives members from the, the community a way to make a tangible impact on the threat of gun violence in their own city. Um, individuals in the city can make an impact by donating and, and helping support the, yeah, the buyback right. fund. Is Basically, anybody can make a donation that yeah. will effectively remove a gun from yeah. their city. 
And uh, when I talked to you or emailed you just uh, yesterday, you said you had just launched one for Santa Barbara. We did. Uh, after the, the shooting in Isla Vista, um, you know, we were really, really heartbroken by yeah. it. And um, we have a, a partner organization on the ground, the Coalition Against Gun Violence, the Santa Barbara chapter that we're working with. They had already been planning a gun buyback for June 14th. Uh -huh. So we're helping them run this campaign to raise additional funds for it. And who else do you work with on the ground? Obviously, you must be working with the police departments. How does that go? Are, are most police departments happy to do these things? I, I imagine they are. They are, yeah. I mean, for, for them, it's, you know, it's, it's illegal and unwanted guns that are taken out of circulation. That it's, you know, fewer guns that they have to worry about that are left in homes or, or held by criminals. Um, so law enforcement is generally very supportive of, of gun buybacks. And they're actually there at the buyback and they take care of destroying the weapons after, after they're bought back. That's right. Yeah, and they hold the event. So what's, what's the general going rate for a, a buying back a gun? Well, it, it uh, differs from city to city based on how they, they operate them. Generally, what we've seen is that typically it's about $100 for most of your standard guns, uh -huh. like uh, handguns and, and rifles and shotguns, and then maybe a bit more, like $200 for an assault weapon. Uh -huh. uh, and how do, how do you know what guns you're buying back? And, and who are they coming from? I mean, it, these are the questions that come up, and I'm sure you get them all the time. Yeah, yeah. So it's a great question. It's, um, it's a little bit difficult to tell exactly where the guns are coming from because the buybacks are anonymous. Um, but, you know, our point of view is that any gun that is in a home that isn't wanted, that isn't being cared for by a responsible gun owner, um, should not be in circulation. So if somebody is on the fence about whether or not they should have this gun, if somebody isn't uh, determined to, you know, keep it and care for it responsibly, then it's one gun that shouldn't be in, in the community. Right. Do I assume from that that uh, gun theft is a source of... A lot of illegal guns, guns stolen Absolutely. from homes. Is that there's, um, you know, the estimates range to up to about 500,000 guns are stolen from homes each year in the U.S. That's a pretty stunning number. Half a million guns are stolen each year. Yeah. So that's kind of your pool that you're trying to buy back. I, it I is. Guess. It's the guns that are, you know, could be stolen. And I think, um, you know, somebody that is not actively pursuing gun ownership and somebody you know, that might participate in a buyback, they're probably far more likely to not be actively storing it um, or, you know, storing it securely. So I, I think th these are the pool of, of guns that we're targeting. But it's also guns that uh, are in a home where, um, you know, maybe there's a, a young child, maybe, maybe somebody's worried about uh, another family member committing suicide. Um, I think there's, there's a variety of reasons why people would want to participate, but generally they are participating because they want to make their homes safer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, gun buybacks have been going on for a while now. Do you know the origins of it? Do you know anything? Like uh, they have been when? going on for a while. The, the biggest one was in Australia where they did a, a, a really big national, uh, national scale gun buyback and I think they reduced the, the stock of guns in circulation by 20 or 30 percent. Um, and it made a huge impact on the rate of gun violence. Was that in the, the wake of the uh, Port, Mac was it Port MacArthur? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. And so, and, and just to be clear, that was also, they did, they did that buyback, but it was also coupled with changes in, in laws around gun ownership. Yeah, they, they instituted very strict gun control in Australia within about 90 days, I think, of that, that tragic accident there. Mm -hmm. it, that's a whole other story on, on itself. So, um, now I, I understand that you say that gun buybacks are anonymous, but hasn't anyone ever tried to do a study of um, who's turning in the guns and where they're coming from? Yeah, we collect data, been? we collect survey data from people that participate to try to get a sense of that. Um, you know, and some of the, the key questions we try to understand are whether or not they intend to ever buy a gun again in the future, whether or not their homes are gun free, um, why they're participating, how they found out about it. Um, those are the kinds of questions. And that's, you know, what we found is that, you know, the overwhelming majority of people don't intend to buy a gun again. 
um, the overwhelming majority of people, that their homes are now gun-free. Both those, it's about 70% of participants. Uh, uh -huh. um, and on top of that, you know, they're really motivated not so much by the money, but more out of this desire to make their homes safer. Right. And the money is a great, you know, catalyst to, to get them to turn their gun in uh, that day. Yeah. But um, generally the, the overall motivation is, is safety. And I think that's important. I think, um, you know, I, I don't think gun buybacks would be as effective if it was a, a great way to make some money out of, out of the guns that you have. I think you want to be able to, to target the people that are really just looking to uh, not have the gun around anymore. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I realize as you're talking about that and incentives and stuff, I, I don't really have any idea how much a gun costs. I'm no one. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you turn in a, a gun for $100, does that buy you a new gun? Do you, do you know how much guns cost? I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, it's intentionally priced to be below the market rate yeah, for okay. guns. I think if you, yeah, if you were to, to price it higher than you'd create a, a way for somebody to just make some money by going out and buying guns and turning it in at a buyback. Mm -hmm. So do they really, have there been any studies of how effective they are? I mean, I, how many guns would you expect, for example, to get from the Santa Barbara buyback? Uh, we'll see. It, 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 it varies from city to city and we've never we, done we, a buyback. What's your own in, best one? Uh, in uh, San Francisco, we've, we've got, I believe, 170 guns at, at a single buyback event. Yeah, and how many guns are in San Francisco? Do you have an idea? Uh, we don't know, yeah. no. There's, um, is, is it right? I think it's about 300 million guns in this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's not right. good yeah. data on that. Um, but I think there have been a lot of studies that have shown that there's an almost one-to-one -one correlation between uh, the rate of gun ownership and the rate of homicides in a community and the rate of suicides in a community. It's actually uh, one to 0.9. And so, you know, our point of view is that even if they haven't shown to work, uh, haven't, haven't shown an impact on overall crime statistics in the past, if we keep doing them and keep getting to a larger scale, uh -huh. then we'll know that we'll be able to make an impact on these reductions numbers. in the suicides and things like gun exactly. accidents. Yeah, yeah so our, our short-term metric is how many, how are we impacting the rate of gun ownership and the total number of guns in circulation? Yeah. And we know that that is, uh, will have an impact on the overall uh, gun violence statistics. Mm -hmm. Do either of you know how many guns are sold new in this country every year? I don't no, know that I don't number. know what the total, total figure is, but um, <coughs> given that, you know, there are, Walmart is selling AR-15s, um, I think it's just a, a huge number and um, uh, virtually everywhere. But something that we've been looking at also is the fact of the private dealers that are in the communities and are so often um, not looked at or not known about by um, people in the neighborhood. Um, we found in the South Bay that there were a number of instances of uh, a private gun dealer um, being right next to a child care center or right next to a school and very few requirements on them to do the things that uh, a retailer with a traditional brick and mortar uh, location does like uh, hardening the exterior of the building, um, putting in security cameras, uh, all those kinds of things that have been done for brick and mortar stores when a city demands it. Um, but the uh, home dealers are uh, really operating pretty much under the radar of um, most communities. You know, I'm going to guess that a lot of our viewers don't know about home gun dealers and private gun dealers. Why don't you just explain this <laughs> little cottage industry a little bit more for our viewers? Well, those are individuals who uh, buy and sell firearms. They're uh, federally licensed uh, out of their homes. And it is interesting to um, go onto the website for the federally licensed firearms dealers and just see what are the locations and what are the locations that are near me or near what I know to be a sensitive use, like a, a daycare, a children's recreational facility, uh, a school. And um, I, I don't know of any California communities right now 
that have the same uh, requirements for security on the home dealers that they have uh, on the the retail on stores. A gun store. um, so that I, I think presents a, a real problem, and it's something that we should each know about. If if the neighbor has a large number of guns, um, and there is potentially a security risk. Do you uh, know what the website is that you just referred to where people can look up? I don't have the URL, but if you just search uh, federally licensed firearms uh, dealers, uh, it'll give you the website and uh, there's a new uh, Excel spreadsheet that's uploaded to the site every month that has the current uh, licensees listed on it. So you can find out if there's gun dealers in your neighborhood that you, you might look around and say, oh, there's no gun shops in my town and then find that 10 people are selling guns out of their home. Right, exactly. And uh, we do have some communities that say that uh, a gun dealer can't be located within a certain number of feet of uh, residential. Uh, uh, but those are few in number in terms of the number of cities that have that type of an ordinance. Yeah. Let me turn back to you, Ian, on the, on the uh, gun buybacks. Uh, this question of not even knowing you know, really the situation in our own towns. Do you use the uh, occasion of a gun buyback to try to do public education about gun safety and just general gun knowledge, what it, the status of our guns in this country, things like home dealers and stuff like that? Yeah, we do, and it's something that we want to do more of. I think buybacks are a, a great opportunity to educate people and inform them of the risks of, of gun in the home. They certainly seem to draw media coverage. The media seem to like having gun buybacks to go uh, film and stuff. They do, yeah. But Lots on, of good pictures of it, scary yeah, guns. So, and, so it is a good opportunity. Um, yeah, it is. And that's something we want to do more of, is as we're raising money for these gun buybacks, to also you know, partner with other groups, uh, other school systems, um, to spread the word and, and say, you know, this buyback is coming up and if you have a gun in your home, these are the risks that it presents and so it might be a good idea to turn it in. Um, and I also wanted to, to mention, you know, you, you, you mentioned the, the statistic of there being about 300 million guns in the U.S. Um, and that is true and that number always goes up because these guns that are out there in circulation, they never really go bad or expire. Right. Um, but what is happening is that the rate of gun ownership in the U.S. is declining pretty significantly too. So it's fewer people owning more guns each. Exactly, yeah. Uh -huh. You know, I think it was at its peak around the, the early 70s that around 40% of homes had guns in them. And now estimates are down at around 32%. And when you look at younger people below 30, it's even lower than that. It's in the 20s. So I think there is a trend uh, away from gun ownership, uh, despite the fact that the total number of guns in circulation keeps rising. Hmm. Why do people own so many guns? You know, I, I, I guess it's just a, a collector's sort of thing. They well, recently, um, you know, a lot of people are talking about the open carry movement, yeah. um, where people feel compelled to uh, go down to local fast food restaurant um, with uh, AR-15s or uh, whatever they have, uh, often multiple guns with them. Um, and so one thing that we can do as consumers is start to really uh, highlight the companies that are still allowing open carry and those who have uh, banned it now. Um, so uh, Starbucks has banned open carry. Uh, Chipotle Grill has banned open carry now. Um, Home Depot just allowed the largest open carry event ever um, to be held in the United States, to be held in one of their parking lots. And so uh, I think it's something... I don't understand that. They're holding an event so people can come walk around their parking lot with their gun? Uh, basically, that's, that's what it is. <laughs> and, and so I think we can use our, our power as consumers. Yeah. When we see these very, very egregious examples of this kind of errant, threatening behavior, yeah and really uh, point it out and, and say, I'm not going to go to that chain. I'm going to uh, reward another chain that has done the right thing. 
And, um, and so, let them know that you're doing that. It's yeah, absolutely. Now, um, in the age of uh, Twitter, it's, it's very easy to uh, tweet using the Twitter handle of a business that has banned open carry and say, I'm, I'm meeting my friends at Chipotle Grill to show my support uh, for what they've done. That's an excellent idea. Excellent idea that, that people can do. Um, didn't even the NRA make some kind of statement that taking one's AR-15 to the Chipotle is probably not the best uh, PR that they could do? They've recently uh, asked their members to quote unquote, stop acting so weird. <laughs> and, uh, is that how they put it? And uh, uh, they've identified- I, I have trouble <laughs> thinking of Wayne LaPierre and asking other people not to act so weird. <laughs> well, I mean, it's gotten to a point where um, they've, they've said, um, don't threaten the, the groups of moms that are organizing uh, around gun violence reduction. That doesn't look good for us. Uh, don't do egregious open carry um, because it looks too strange. And um, so I think that there's, uh, you know, when it gets to the point that even they are trying to uh, rein in their members, then we, we know that it's gotten bad. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty bad. Um, back to buybacks, just to kind of wrap up and then we're gonna jump on, on lo local registration, but um, you talked about uh, some of the educational component of what you're trying to do and, and wanting to ramp that up more. On the flip side of that, is there a possibility of a, a negative reaction in that people see a gun buyback in their town and it, it gets in the news and there's a big splash that weekend and everyone goes home feeling good that all these guns are out of their community and it kind of stops action there? Uh, I don't think so at all. I, you know, I, I think our point of view and, and you know the the I think a lot of the people that are participating in, in our fundraising campaigns you know it's gonna take a multi-pronged approach to prevent gun violence right. and this is just you know one tool in the toolbox right um, and if you look at uh, tobacco as a as another example like that was there was a lot of different things that happened in order to really turn the tide on, on the, the rate of tobacco and, uh, sorry, the, the rate of deaths that were, were coming yeah. from cigarettes. And it was, you know, marketing campaigns, it was educational campaigns, it was lawsuits, it was changes in legislation. And I think, you know, gun buybacks are just one other piece of the one puzzle. Piece, yeah. And, you know, the way we think about it is that it, it's a way of providing this short-term progress while we continue to work on, on changes uh, to policies and laws, which do take so long. Yeah. So, you know, we, we sort of equate it to in, uh, you know, in the environmentalist movement, you know, you really to make a difference in, in climate change, you need to change the energy policy. But what you can do in the meantime is organize a beach cleanup and make a statement and, and uh, tell other people in your community what you value and what kind of, uh, what kind of place you want to live in. Yeah, that's an excellent analogy. Okay, and so um, you currently have, uh, I want to go back to the gun buyback in Santa Barbara that, uh, that you've just launched. The website, by the way, is gunbygun.org, and we'll be putting that up on the screen. I assume the uh, fundraising is open to anyone, not just Santa Barbara. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> so um, tell People will go to gun by gun. Yeah, you can go to, to gun by gun .org. BY, not BUY, but right. gun by gun. Gun by gun .org, and, and you can make a donation, and it will go directly to a buyback that's happening in Santa Barbara on June 14th. And does any of that money go to administrative overhead, advertising? Nope, it just goes straight to the buybacks. It all goes to, buy to, to buybacks. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. gun by gun .org. Check it out. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would just add to that that individuals uh, shouldn't be shy about having a, a little house party and passing the hat. And if the party could collect uh, $200 and take down an assault weapon, or even just collect $100 getting friends together at Chipotle Grill uh, <laughs> and passing the hat around the table there, collect $100 and take down a handgun yeah. um, that is unwanted and is very likely at some point to become a crime gun if it's not dismantled. I can see Chipotle developing a whole marketing program. <laughs> That's a really good idea. The so women are definitely going to Chipotle. <laughs> <laughs>
I'll mm. have to try them again. <laughs> let's let's talk about the other side of this um, stuff that does take a little bit longer, um, but has a little bit more teeth in, and that's uh, the possibility of of local legislation. And um, you know, we, we're not talking about solutions here because that's that's a big society picture question. But mm -hmm. we're talking about sensible gun laws for mostly safety measures. Now, um, I, I guess I'll start with, um, since we launched this by talking about the lack of action in Congress, I think most people are thinking that it, it's up to Congress to do this. But in fact, local jurisdictions have a lot of leeway to do their own gun measures, whether it's a, a city or a county or, or the state. Could you just lay out that picture for people because I think a lot of people don't know that. Absolutely, there's a, a very large uh, repertoire of, of solutions that can be pursued at any of those levels, the city, county, uh, or the state. And there were a number of good uh, gun safety uh, bills that passed the state legislature last year. About half of the ones that were proposed uh, did pass. And so the remainder are uh, coming back this year. And there was more money added to the budget to really go out and have law enforcement be able to check out the individuals that are prohibited persons. When we've made a match in the databases that says, hey, a prohibited person has purchased uh, a gun or ammunition. And uh, so extra money was put in the state budget last year for going out to that. But we really need to have the local communities uh, get into the game here. And uh, last November, we had a measure that passed in Sunnyvale. Measure C. Uh, measure C, it was voted, there were more votes on that question than on any other question or candidate on the ballot in Sunnyvale. And under the wow. threat of an NRA lawsuit, uh, the citizens in Sunnyvale voted more than two thirds in favor of um, some very common sense uh, gun safety measures. Um, there was also recently in Los Gatos, uh, the town council passed uh, some dealer regulations there when um, they found that um, a, a major uh, gun store was coming in on their main street um, and that they didn't have the uh, local ordinances in place that would prevent it from staying there forever. And so there's just a, a whole uh, repertoire of solutions, everything from a city saying that they're gonna divest of um, investments in gun manufacturing, which is very common sense and much needed, to the dealer regulations that I talked to before, to what we pursued in Sunnyvale, which was a requirement that guns be locked up in the home, whether or not a child is present. We've seen in the news a large number of instances where someone doesn't have their gun locked up because there isn't normally a child in that home. But when the child comes there and finds the gun, there are very tragic uh, circumstances. In Sunnyvale, we also pursued uh, reporting of lost or stolen guns to um, try to shut down that flow of of legitimately owned guns that become crime guns. And then um, we also were able to institute a ban on the possession of large magazines, magazines of 10 or rep more rounds. And these are already, the sale is banned under California law, but all the individuals who had them were grandfathered in in terms of possession. Uh -huh. So what Sunnyvale has said is that uh, you can't possess them uh, in the city of Sunnyvale, which means that if someone lives in Sunnyvale and they own that type of a weapon, they can dispose of it down at the police department, although most people like to go to a gun buyback because it's more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but you can take it to the police department any day. Um, or they have to store it uh, somewhere that's not in Sunnyvale. Um, and this is what we would like to see. Uh, so, let, let me just make sure we're clear on that. The California law says they can own these if, if they owned them before the law went into effect. Before they, they the, can no longer the year be 2000. Yeah. Right. But Sunnyvale and presumably any other town in this state can ban the ownership. Can, can ban the possession of them. 
not the, not the ownership, but they can ban the possession. And um, oh, interesting distinction. But so yeah. they, they can own them, but they can't possess them within the city limits of Sunnyvale at this point. Right. Yeah. And so obviously we would like to see some of the, the ordinances that were passed in Sunnyvale spread to all of the Bay Area. We'd like to have a completely gun safe uh, Bay Area uh, for the people who live here. Um, so that's something that, that we're working on and that's just been presented to the Mountain View City Council with a request for them to either pass uh, such ordinances or put them on the ballot so that yeah. the voters can decide. Yeah, I saw that the city council asked to um, the city staff to review the Sunnyvale measure in particular and, and let them know. You mentioned earlier in the program about something in Sunnyvale about the ammunition. Right. That was another, the that's, fourth element of this, That's right? the fourth element, um, is registration on ammunition and requiring that the dealers keep records of ammunition purchases, uh, again, so that the prohibited individuals um, can be identified, and that uh, those records be available to law enforcement to examine. Um, right now... Uh, so, it, so it's not being reported electronically or anything, it's just if you own a gun store, you have to, to write down the, the ammunition. And, and this, the logic behind this particular piece of the legislation is that somebody may be banned from buying a gun because they're on the do not buy list or something, but they, they get a gun, they steal it from someone, and then they, they need the ammunition and they go to the gun store and even though they're on the, the uh, prohibited list, they can buy as much ammunition as they want, right? Right, or um, just if, if police uh, have an individual under surveillance for some other reason, um, they're able to identify then very large uh, purchases of ammunition. Um, if the individual is under surveillance and, and isn't on the prohibited uh, persons list, since again, we don't have the mechanism in place in many counties, uh, to be able to do that. Um, so uh, the NRA and uh, several individuals in the community said that they would sue on these measures. Right. Uh, they did come forward and sue both on the, the magazine ban and on uh, the ammunition record keeping. And I'm really pleased to say that they've lost the first rounds in the federal court uh -huh. uh, on, on both those lawsuits and been chastised by the federal judges that these are not measures that, that uh, would at all impede anything that anyone would be able to identify as a Second Amendment right. Right, to, to own a gun. And yeah. um, so, uh, one of the uh, requests to uh, put a stay on the implementation uh, on the um, magazine ban uh, went all the way up to the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court already and was turned down um, in terms of a stay on that action. So the appeals process is ongoing. It's going to be ongoing for many, many years. <laughs> uh, that's just the reality about our appeals court systems at the federal level. And so we're really trying to work with the city councils to have them understand that these lawsuits are not going to be resolved and um, be given a, a free and clear signal um, anytime soon. And that if they want to take action, they should take action in the interim. And that through uh, the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence, we have access to a number of very strong law firms that have offered to step up and provide pro bono assistance to any city in the Bay Area that wants to uh, take this on. I, I take it the NRA um, threatens these lawsuits in advance of an election or city council action uh, pretty much as a way of saying um, we're going to cost you Sunnyvale or you Mountain View a lot of money if, if you pass these these ordinances. Is that it? It's just yeah, kind of they, financial intimidation? In, in Sunnyvale, uh, the lawsuits were threatened before the measure even went on the ballot, uh -huh. but we were able to get a commitment for pro bono representation, 100% free 
uh, to the taxpayers uh, before the measure went on the ballot. And I'm very proud of uh, voters in Sunnyvale that uh, they didn't buy uh, the NRA's arguments in this case. And um, they stepped up and said that this is something that they wanted for their city in a very, very strong way. Yeah. Um, let's talk about that campaign a little bit. I know you were involved with Measure C and helped them out. You have some experience in campaigning yourself. <laughs> but it really was kind of a, a grassroots, homegrown effort. Um, it was uh, very grassroots, very homegrown, uh, very uh, low budget. Um, and we were really asking people who lived in Sunnyvale to uh, really look at the issue. Um, one of the things that I think benefits uh, gun measures, whether they're considered by council or placed on the ballot for the voters' consideration, is that just about everybody in the Bay Area is a policy wonk at a very deep level. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think that there's a, a real desire to see uh, government doing good, uh, responsible, sophisticated kinds of legislation, uh, whether uh, at the local, regional, state, or federal level. And um, so we, we couldn't afford to go to the voters very many times. We weren't stuffing the mailbox with a lot of paper. Uh -huh. um, we actually only did two mailers and some cheap fold-over pieces that were kind of mimeographed. Um, but uh, the voters uh, support it in a very, very strong way. Yeah, they, that's incredible. Uh, two thirds of the, the vote, was it? Yeah, uh, over two thirds. It. And had the backing of the mayor. Why, why didn't the city council just pass these uh, regulations? Is it important that the, the voters have, have their say? Does, does that help with the lawsuits or anything? Or? Uh, council in, in Sunnyvale was not willing to go there, um, so we didn't have a choice. Uh -huh. But obviously, uh, a campaign of whatever size is, is somewhat laborious. Sunnyvale is about 150,000 uh, residents. Um, so it's not a small undertaking. Um, so it is preferable to have, have council just step up. But um, really, there's so much interest coming forward from so many different communities um, to have something placed on the ballot. And so that's something that we're providing assistance with. Yeah, you mentioned the, uh, the Law Center. For, what's the official name, Law Center? Uh, Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence. Yeah, uh, it's an excellent website. I hadn't told our graphics person to put it up, but maybe they can get uh, smartgunlaws.org up there. That's correct, right? Smartgunlaws.org. Smartgunlaws.org. It is loaded with really good information. You'll learn a lot about gun legislation and <laughs> regulations and uh, what can be done. Um, talk a little bit more about Los Gatos and what, what they did. And that was another kind of grassroots sort of thing too, wasn't it? Yes, it was very grassroots. Um, when uh, people found out that uh, a store that was billed as a sporting goods store and was going in on uh, the, the main uh, commercial street in town uh, was really uh, going to be a gun dealership that was selling uh, military type weapons. And it was oh. not what um, neighbors in town there wanted, um, and so they were able to Doesn't get... It seemed like it fits in with the kind of boutique nature of Los Gatos. Right, right. Either. People would generally go to Los Gatos yeah. to relax. Um, <laughs> so um, council uh, gave the dealer a three-year time horizon that they can stay there, and then they would have to apply for a, a permit to be located there. And the supposition is that um, town council would probably mm. not uh, um, be granting a permit given the community opposition yeah. to it. Um, right now, Los Gatos is facing um, a real challenge from the fact that a lot of the area that's identified as the town of Los Gatos is really um, unincorporated county land. And so the ordinances adopted by town council are not in effect for those unincorporated areas. Yeah. Um, and so we're working with them to uh, reach out to the Board of Supervisors and see if we can get coverage for those unincorporated areas. 
Yeah, that's when you get down to local laws, it, it can really become kind of a patchwork quilt, it, can it, because of these unincorporated areas and things. Um, what other towns in the area on the peninsula are, 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 do Sunnyvale and Los Gatos stand out, or are there other towns that have these uh, good they, regulations, and yeah, they, or are most up for grabs, and we need to inspire activists to get out there and yeah, talk to Yeah, I think to we need to ins inspire activists um, all over, and it's never going to be the case that we're going to have really a, a unified front. Um, moving along, I think it's going to be a lot more like the plastic bag ban of a city here, a city there, and pretty soon you have really good coverage. Um, and uh, you know, I get asked a lot, does it really matter if um, this town or that town does it if the next town over doesn't? Right. And in many cases, um, activists find themselves in the position of asking communities in um, what I would term to be very red states, uh, unlike the Bay Area, uh, to step up and get good gun laws in those areas. Well, my own feeling is that we can't go out to people in another area if we're not doing it ourselves here. Right. Um, and we will still have the, the issue of very loose gun laws in our uh, neighboring states like Nevada. Um, but it's something that we can all uh, break a piece off of. Uh, we can all go down to city council and uh, speak to them. I was at Palo Alto Council uh, last night and I'm very hopeful that they'll step up on uh, safer gun laws. Um, but we need individuals to just go and show themselves at council, uh, in letters to the editor, uh, online, on the social media. You know, there's a lot of discussion now, does clicking on something really help? Yes, if you click on gun by gun and you're then getting uh, the alerts about the gun buybacks, uh, that helps. If you click on Moms Demand Action, and you see what are the latest uh, businesses to go to or to avoid, uh, that's very helpful. If we each just do one thing per day, even if it's a small thing, um, it, it will make a big difference in the end. And so that's what we're really uh, aiming for, is uh, just to create this uh, very beautiful, very strong patchwork of local activists um, coming out and, and asking elected officials and their other community members to step up. Yeah, and if your laptop is down, you can go have lunch at Chipotle. <laughs> Just go to Chipotle. <laughs> I would like to get an idea, if you can summarize this somehow. The, you went through the four elements of Measure C in Sunnyvale, the, which all sound very good. And, and What other kinds of things that can local jurisdictions, what are they allowed to implement that you think would be really the best things to, mm -hmm. to implement as, as local legislation? I, I think that the, the divestment is huge. There's now a, a movement uh, since the Isla Vista, Santa Barbara shooting to ask the University of California to divest. And Do we know yet if they are invested in they are invested in manufacturers and, um, over the past year since Newtown, the teachers' retirement system uh, has divested. Other retirement systems have uh, divested. The California and teachers, California teachers, and um, we really need to have every large pool of government money getting out of gun manufacturing. Um, this is one of the, the tools that's very, very important. And there's a change.org petition out there. Again, if you just search the web on uh, University of California divestment guns, uh, it's very important to sign this change.org mm -hmm. petition. And we would really welcome cities stepping up and sending a letter uh, to the University of California system as well. Uh, cities are... Uh, what does the divestment do other than make a bold public statement from a large institution? Well, it, it starves the gun manufacturers of funds. And, um, you know, my own feeling is, and uh, this may sound harsh, is that uh, our gun manufacturers are preying on individuals with mental illness to make money. 
uh, they're fostering suffering in our communities to make money. So we need to use all the tools that are at our disposal to shut down the pipeline of money to them and starve them of the capital that they need to operate. You know, frankly, I think that if every city stepped up and had a Measure C and they had to sue every single city, <laughs> you know, that would, yeah. that would starve them of money as well, the NRA rather than uh, the manufacturers. Um, but there are just a, a wide variety of um, things like that that we can do. And, and really take it on on every front. Call radio call-in shows. Um, send letters to elected officials. And you know, really, my top piece of advice in sending letters to elected officials is: whereas in normal life you would want to send the nicest-looking letter possible, when you send it to an elected official, send the ugliest, most notable letter possible. The one where um, the envelope and the card don't match each other. They're the wrong size, so people notice it. Uh, the birthday card, when it's not their birthday. <laughs> um, the letter that's written on the back of a child's drawing. Um, the, the stationery that you get free from Save the Whales. All those kinds of things. Just make your letter as different as possible from an 8.5 by 11 white piece of paper. Stick, stick magazine articles in it, stick newspaper articles in it, uh, all those kinds of things. Just be as different as you possibly can. And I, I really think that if we try all of these strategies, we're going we're gonna to get a big change out of it. That's what all this is about, right? The, the gun buybacks, it's step by step, building awareness, the, the local town legislation, step by step. You know, none of these things are solutions, as, as I said earlier. Yeah, and I think Sally <clears throat> touched on a really good point in, um, I think the opposition on this issue, you know, the opponents really aren't the responsible gun owners. I think it is, the opponents are this this massive industry group, and I think what it boils down to is, is money. Um, I think there's a, a ton of money to be made by the, the current system of how guns are sold and distributed, and I think that's really what we're battling against. Mm -hmm. So things like divestiture are, yeah. um, they, they are a way to, to really uh, strike at the heart of, of the opposition. Mm -hmm. Has there been a successful divestment movement anywhere around guns? Well, just in terms of the California, the state retirement funds. Uh, the um, teachers you has, mentioned, yeah. Has been very successful. And uh, you know, many cities, uh, not every city, but many cities uh, do purchase what's called commercial paper. Uh, which can involve um, investments in gun manufacturing and et cetera. Um, so if, if we look at that and ask each city to support divestment, um, even if they don't currently have uh, any of that in their portfolio, it's still a very good thing. Yeah. Um, related to the gun manufacturers, I, I think the NRA has made the claim that they are not financed by the gun industry, but I think it's pretty clear that First of all, don't most of the manufacturers have a, uh, someone on the board of the NRA? And um, yeah, I, I think the uh, is there a provable link between the manufacturers and and the NRA? Yeah, I I don't know if there currently is, but just just the level of the the cynicism um, around what they argue is is proof in itself, um, and it's really a movement that. Uh, no one needs uh, an assault rifle to go down to a Walmart. Um, you know, the statistics show that individuals and families are much more at risk with a gun than without a gun. And communities are much more at risk uh, with guns being present than, um, than without. And uh, I, I think that this is really a, a movement is, as Ian referred to, the young people are, are leading. They're not interested in having guns. Yeah. Um, they are okay with the diversity in society. They see it as a real benefit to society. And so I think that we're gonna have a lot of progress in the future. But even just stopping um, one gun, as, as Ian has referred to, can stop um, a terrible, terrible crime that if it doesn't result in death, can result in a lifetime of disfigurement and yeah. need for care. Um, it can stop a suicide in its tracks. Um, it can stop just the general terror that people feel in society now 
uh, going to a movie theater, a library, uh, a shopping mall, going just about anywhere. Any of us can fall victim to this. And I noticed the other day in, in downtown San Jose that they had canceled, because of the Isla Vista shootings, the active shooter training that they were going to have in the downtown main library. And when did we get to the point in this country where we were just expecting active shooters to be in our libraries and schools and dress shops and uh, workplaces and every place else? Uh, um, meaning kind of a fire drill? Or, yeah, or, abs absolutely. Geez. And and we need to step up and fight back for uh, the future of just having a real life uh, that's that's wholesome and safe and uh, where we can do the things that we want to do yeah. uh, without that interference. Very quickly, because we only have a couple of minutes left, but um, Justice John, uh, for, former Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens just came out with a new book called Six Amendments, and one of the amendments that he wants to make to the Constitution is adding a few words to the uh, Second Amendment which he says is very clear that it's not aimed at individual ownership of, of, of guns. Um, the head of the um, Brennan Center for Justice at New York University has a new book out also uh, where he makes the, the same argument. Is there any hope of ever clarifying the Second Amendment that it's not talking about individual ownership of assault weapons, or do you think? Yeah, I, I, I think so. As, as society changes, I think we're going to have uh, the opportunity to do that. Um, I, I hope that that'll come. I think we also have to address uh, corporate personhood and, and shut that down, and we need to pass the Equal Rights Amendment after 38 years. Yes. <laughs> but, um, but this is really, uh, this is big time, the need to uh, shut down the flow of guns um, into our communities. That's all the time we have here on Other Voices. Ian Johnstone of Gun by Gun, gunbygun.org, and Sally Lieber, uh, gadfly activist, <laughs> <laughs> a natural resource here on the <laughs> peninsula. You've been watching uh, Other Voices brought to you by Peninsula Peace and Justice Center. I'm your host, Paul George. We're here live on the first Tuesday of every month. July is going to be a look back at the one-year anniversary of uh, Edward Snowden, and in August we're going to feature the 50th anniversary of the Mississippi Freedom Summer. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next month. Thank you both. Thank you.